we now have a very very exciting segment to get into um this is now an interview segment so uh it's a story that i've told countless times but when i was 15 i played a game called journey the experience i had with the game changed my life and made me look at video games in a completely new way and now because of my experience with that game seven years later i'm a video game journalist i'm gaining experience and being trained at university and i get to make content with my best friend of 20 years I never once imagined that we would get to interview the creative mind behind the game, but we have. We are so lucky to say that earlier today we sat down and talked with the creative director at that game company, the Guinness World Record holder, award-winning designer, and incredible human being, the one, the only, Genova Chen. Take a look. Genova, thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to have you on the show. How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to be here talking to you guys. Great. <laughs> Um, to hear it. So uh, we thought we'd start with uh, some questions uh, about you and your taste in video games to start off with, um, to kind of give people mm. a sense of uh, what you like playing as well as uh, in comparison to what you create. Interesting. Yeah. So many, very few people ask me about my taste of video games. Well, that's a great start. <laughs> well, yeah, we thought it's uh, it's not something you've covered a lot before, um, and it gives people a bit of a taste. You know, they compare it to what they like and, and everything. So, mm. I mean, first of all, game development is a really busy job, kind of famously. Um, so, do you manage to to keep up and play a lot of games while you're creating your own? Uh, to be honest, I when I was a teenager. Uh, I spend majority of my time playing games. You know, my appetite for games was huge, and I have no taste. I, I just kind of play any game I can get. Right? That that's kind of like what I do because everything's new. Uh, but as I grow older, I, I realize that, you know, uh, you know, as you grow older, your taste buds kind of start to have uh, chaos. Right? You start to, uh, you know, find things that's uh, no longer impressing you. And what I remembered uh, are the first experiences of many uh, emotional impact. Like uh, the first scary game to me is Doom. Uh, the first uh, scary, you know, I pee my pants game is Resident Evil. Uh, but ever after, you know, all the scary games kind of like I can predict what they're about to do. Mm. So they are no longer scary. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so, so it's all about kind of building up the expectation. So nowadays, when you work on a game, uh, you know, you spend long hours working on something. So the time you play games start to shrink. I think, you know, 10 years ago, when I was still making, uh, you know, flower, I think I play about two hours uh, a day, uh, video games. Um, and then to now, I... I, I don't really have more than an hour to play games a day and usually it's breaking up into these uh, fragments uh, so more and more I start to be uh, more careful about what type of game I would commit myself to you know like if uh, I remember back then when I was still working at Maxis on Spore I bought this game uh, Final Fantasy 12 I mean my name is Genova mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, you know how much I'm, I'm a dedicated fan for, for Final Fantasy and uh but it just takes hours and hours of grinding and to the point i felt like i i just want to know the story of the next chapter i want to see the beautiful art but i don't want to be grinding here so i bought this very thick like a brick like book you know the the official guideline and the walkthrough telling you what you have to do and still i could not uh, beat the game fast enough and eventually i have to go to watch youtube um and uh, that kind of summarizes my frustration as an adult who has now more responsibility and a kid, you know, and uh, a family. So um, nowadays I tend to play shorter uh, but unique indie games uh, or sometimes I have toilet games uh, thanks to the smartphone. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, yeah, I think we all feel the frustration of time constraints when you're an adult and you're trying to fit in as many long video games yeah. as possible. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, with that in mind, though, are there any games that you're playing at the moment? Then any any kind of little games that you can fit in among your big, you know, kind of busy schedule? Uh huh. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the very last long game that I played over a hundred hours uh, was Dark Souls Two. I think. All oh, right. Uh, it, it is it is so strange that even though Dark Souls is probably the most opposite game compared to what that game company makes, but 
spiritually, there's so much, so many things that is aligned. You know, in terms of their uh, multiplayer systems, in terms of their, you know, kind of uh, ambient uh, narrative storytellings, and uh, uh, even leaving little notes. Uh, now we, we have similar designs in Sky. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I was lucky to uh, have met uh, Miyazaki san who has uh, be, uh, been telling us about their future game. Uh, and it, it is kind of interesting that uh, uh, seeing him in person <laughs> made me feel like, yeah, actually, kind of, like, I kind of look like him. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, on that note, are there any uh-huh. uh, are there any game developers or creators that have inspired your work? Uh, I would say uh, certainly uh, Miyamoto. Uh, when when Miyamoto was playing uh, the journey at E3, uh, my coworker was calling me. saying, "You gotta get over here. You know, Miyamoto is playing your game." So I have to go there to shake his hand and listen to the translator telling me how he actually enjoyed the game. That's like my highlight of my career. Uh, and and the other uh, influential uh, designer is uh, Fumito Ueda. Uh, who did uh, the uh, uh, Shadow of the Colossus and the Eco? Yeah. Uh, if you if you played Sky, you would know uh, there's a lot of children holding hands. Uh, <laughs> that's basically my homage to uh, the Eco uh, experience. Yeah. Um, and in terms of uh, Western designers, I you know uh, I would say uh, Rob Pardo and the World of Warcraft, which is a life changing experience for me. Um, and uh, let's say uh, I, I also really, really liked uh, the first uh, real-time strategy game uh, made by Westwood. Uh, so Dune 2 and uh, uh, I guess that's not Westwood, but uh, Command and Conquer. Um, and, uh, you know, looking back from today's perspective and taste, yeah, you know, the story is a bit turn and cheek kind of B-movie-like, but playing as a kid uh, in China who has never seen anything uh, in Hollywood, uh, it was like, to me, it was like the big movie, and I took everything so seriously when I played the original Command and Conquer. I, I almost believe it was the future or something like that. Um, yeah, uh, and, and another one is uh, uh, Sam Hauser and the Grand Theft Auto theories, which is kind of like a different thing. So, so as a kid, I certainly loved the experience, but they had a huge impact in me because I was trying so hard to be the opposite of Grand Theft Auto, yeah. uh, <laughs> which helped me to kickstart my career because while I was in graduate school, uh, I was so dying for making money so I could pay my tuition. So the school has this grant uh, uh, called Game Innovation Grant. So if any student can come up with a game idea that is like pushing the boundary of uh, what's not on the mainstream, they can win $20,000. So Grand Theft Auto San, San Andreas was the game that was kind of blamed by the media for the Columbine shooting. Um, and uh, they were saying video games cause kids to shoot, you know, do violent crimes. That was like 15 years ago. And so I was trying to sit on Grand Theft Auto, um, and which and then the game was called Cloud that kicked up my career. And because of Cloud, uh, many many people wrote email to tell me that I should turn these games into commercial games, and somehow I should start a company. And uh, till to this day, I still feel thankful to players who really encouraged me to pursue uh, a game career, because otherwise I would have been happy to go to be employed by Pixar and working in the animation industry. <laughs> Um, so just before we get on to kind of your company specifically, I know we're kind of heading towards that mm-hmm. way, but um, just you mentioned Miyazaki and his upcoming game. Are there any other games that are coming out that you're excited for? Oh, uh, I can't tell you his upcoming game. That's not secure. No, of course. No, that's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, the other, I mean, I'm certainly psyched for the Cyberpunk because I'm also mm. a Ke- Ke- Kino Reeves fan. So. Yeah, but 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 that it just say that seems just too common, you know. Like everybody likes that. Um, um, right now, uh, you know, I, I was also pretty excited about Vanilla WoW, <laughs> just for nostalgia factor. Yeah. Um, I, I, as of this very moment, I 
I don't really have any particular game that I would say it was I think a year or two ago uh, that I was truly excited about it and uh, it, it was published by Annapurna uh, Interactive yeah great publisher uh, it's, a, it's an indie game yeah made by uh, Giant Sparrow uh, I was actually part of the co-founder of the Annapurna Interactive so anyway uh, the reason I'm excited about that game uh, is it's the first video game that ever portrayed the emotion of a black comedy uh, there are funny games right uh, you know from like Goat Simulator to Human Full Flight yeah. uh, but those are what we would call the tongue and cheek funny uh, like ch- uh, chapstick funny like Tom and Jerry uh, but Edith Finch uh, this game is both uh and cynical and dark but also funny at the same time and I just have never experienced any game that has this particular flavor yeah uh, I, personally I like to compare like music novel and movies with games because you can find all these very uh, nuanced emotions uh, and being created into genres and subgenres in these mature medium and games are still relatively young and gaming is very good at you know the action adventure stuff uh, but it, when it comes to more nuanced emotions uh, I'm always looking for new taste when it comes to yeah my taste for video games I like to have something very new that I've never experienced yeah I, I totally agree with you there um, mm-hmm. well let, let's talk about uh, your your studio now uh, so that game mm-hmm. company is such an original name for a game studio so is there <laughs> is there a story behind where that name came from <laughs> indeed uh, so uh, when we were uh when we created this game in school, uh, as I mentioned, called Cloud, uh, it was difficult to find a website. You know, cloud.com is registered, cloudgame.com is registered, um, and we just couldn't find anything cloud and gaming related to uh, to be a website. Uh, so eventually, I think Bing Gordon, who is the co-founder of EA, and he was the chief creative director, and he's also like, like uh, you know, teaching at our school, USC. And so in one of the classes, uh, he uh, mentioned about this game called T- Katamari Damacy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but because it's all Japanese, he, he could not me- remember how to pronounce it. So he, he was struggling with it, with it, and he just ended up saying, oh, that garbage game, you know, where you roll the garbage together. And uh, we, we, we said, oh, it's the garbage game, but it is totally rolling the garbage together. Um, so we were saying, like, what would Bing call a game? You know, what would Bing say about this cloud game? You would probably just say, oh, that cloud game, you know. <laughs> um, and so, so we registered like cloudgame.com and it turns out nobody ever used that. Uh, and we were just kind of find funny because like if whatever game you want, you can just call it that, that whatever game.com. <laughs> dude. It's never registered. Um, and so when we were trying to come up with the name for the company, we were trying so many versions and it just doesn't feel right. And then uh, my co-founder, Kelly's brother, just said, hey, what about that game company? Just like your that cloud game. So uh, one of the things that I've always loved about uh, the games that that game company make uh, is how well the soundtrack blends with the experience. Um, and Austin Wintory has to get a lot of credit for that. But I'm really curious as to how uh, that game company and Austin Wintory, uh, their, their relationship came about. So is there, is there a story or yeah. is there a reason that you guys collaborated so much? We, we worked with Austin back then when I was still in the film school and Austin was in the film conducting department. You know, so both of us are students and we're looking for uh, essentially uh, people to work on our project and he's looking for a project to boost his portfolio. We were looking for someone who can make music for games. Uh, so so that, that was like a hit. So I, I, I'm not really a socializer, so I was asking the people I knew and they told me that they worked with him uh, awesome project for uh, two hundred dollars, right? And it was just, the music was great. Uh, so I, I, I basically uh, approached Austin to say, "Hey, look, we just win some awards with this student game Cloud. Would you mind to uh, make this game, uh, make some music for us for Flow? Uh, I'm working on this thesis project. I need music." And uh, I, I also told him that I need procedural music. I need music that, you know, the sound effect that work with the music. Uh, so he was kind of intrigued. Uh, and so, but I have no money. I, I was a, you know, poor student. Uh, so I said, I'm gonna uh, pay you 250 bucks, right? And uh, that's how I can ba- pay. And uh, he uh, eventually agreed. And. Uh, <laughs> And then, then who knows that this little project of, of his, you know, student era 
turn it into a commercial game and then Sony wanted this to be on the PlayStation so they contract him as the official composer for the for the game um, and then uh, when I was working on Flower I worked with the other composer I worked from USC uh, who was actually also from cinema school Vincent Diamante um, so he did the soundtrack for Cloud uh, and then later he did soundtrack for Flower uh, Austin did soundtrack for Flow and then Journey uh, so Vince is coming back for Sky so I kind of just keep switching between the two composers yeah I mean they both do a great job in their own right they're really interesting to kind of mm-hmm. listen to their distinct sounds <laughs> yeah I mean it's a really distinct personal style I mean yeah. Austin won't really work out for Flower and Vincent would, would not work for Journey no exactly yeah it, it, yeah um, so, kind of on the sound design, uh, Jenny's talk at GDC, she went over how that game company tries to make their games universal um, by using mm-hmm. sound and music, uh, as mm-hmm. opposed to kind of spoken word. So is it ever a challenge, yes. I guess, to you guys as a design team to try and make games that way, so you're not allowed to have characters <laughs> talk to one another so much as communicate through sound? <laughs> uh, it's, it's interesting that I'm about to give a talk about this uh, at the UX conference, but this is so uh, I'm fresh propelled for this question. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so the, the, the key is what we are trying to do with our game is to create a, a stronger or kind of fresh emotional experience between the players because uh, I feel that's really the frontier. Um, you know, most of the games you either fight together or survive together or fight each other. That's pretty much all you think about the relationship between the players. Uh, and uh, we wanted to make a game where people can have a little bit of a connection you know uh, trust and uh, you know I, I wouldn't call it love but there's certain like attachment between the player uh, those are the things I wanted to experiment uh, and so one thing about building these emotions is that you know you don't like let's let's say we're having this interview like we're not really connecting at an emotional level because none of us uh, are vulnerable you know most of the time in the society we we are kind of we have a, our armor uh, or a mask uh, to function you know in the society uh, but for two people to really uh, become friends uh, we used to say like if two soldiers survive the war they become stronger relationship than than blood you know than brothers um, and that's because they have experienced something traumatic together uh, that allows them to become vulnerable with each other and so creating the, this intimacy requires vulnerability um, and uh, the problem is with uh, with voice uh, is uh, it often uh, introduced too much noise uh, from outside the game. You know, if your voice is a little boy, uh, then you feel somewhat not properly represented because you're a grown up man. <laughs> uh, if your voice sounded a little bit like a woman, then you felt like, oh, maybe other people think I'm a girl. I, I don't want to be like that. Right. Uh, or if you hear the other person's making the little woman sound, and then your cynical game of mind will be, oh, that must be a guy. Right. So, so we don't want to introduce the, these sexual contexts. Uh, these are unnecessary because in the world of journey, everyone is a robot figure. They are just a human being. They are not necessarily gendered. Uh, there shouldn't be an age concern either. Um, so, because ultimately, what we want to create is a uh, is a genuine connections that is not uh, that, that does not have a kind of a label. Uh, when I play World of Warcraft, if I type my English spelling a bit poorly, uh, or if uh, they hear me talking on voice chat and they could tell that I'm not a native American uh, and to some extent it distance uh, us you know even though we are all orcs we are all for the horde right but then they start to think oh you're actually not a female even though your character is a female orc um, it, it's like when the reality gets blend into the social dynamics it kind of you know uh, ruins the, 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 the perfect immersion and so we like to keep that immersion outside uh well protected and uh and that's why when we were picking the voice uh, of the journey character or the sky characters uh whenever we try classical instrument it felt like okay yeah, i can see myself being represented by that and there's no gender or age connotations uh but whenever it comes into a voice no matter how you filter it and change it it just gives you a sense of a false identity that does not need to be in the game yeah um 
I mean, I, th- I think it's something that it works so well with your games because they are so universal and they're always open mm-hmm. to interpretation. So everyone can 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 step in and and enjoy them. Um, mm-hmm. But having said that, uh, they are always so open to interpretation. And I'm always I'm always curious to see what other people have thought when they've played Journey or or Flower and they've kind of taken their own meaning from it. So I'm curious: Have you mm-hmm. ever gone online and looked at what other players have? thought your games to me uh yeah because uh, i have written my game to be interpreted exactly through gameplay visuals and sound and uh I, as a artist or creator you want to hope that the the your readers your your audience will get what you are trying to say so i definitely love to read what the player has to say about the game just to see if they actually got the exact version that i wish they come up by themselves you know yeah what's the what's the most ridiculous interpretation that you've heard or seen? <laughs> uh okay the most ridiculous one it's not actually an interpretation it's a person of experience so this mm. This boy, he said uh, when he was 14 and he fell into a frozen lake, you know, the, he falls through the ice. And by the time the ambulance came, when they pulled him up, the fireman pulled him up, they told him that he was medically, uh, clinically dead for two minutes. Um, and they was miraculously br- be able to bring him back. And so growing up, a lot of people were asking him how, how, how it's like when he was like dead for two minutes. Uh, and he said he used all kinds of literatures and movies and things to help to communicate with their friends who asked these questions. And he said after he played Journey for the first time, he felt this is out of all medium the most accurate portrait of what it's like to be near death and uh, coming back. <laughs> that's uh, incredible. Yeah, I, I was just like, I don't know what it's like, but if you tell me that's the most close to experience, I'm pretty happy because that's a beautiful experience, right? So, yeah. Um, All right, so um, I think we're going to move on now and talk a bit about Sky before we let you go. So, mm-hmm. um, obviously, it's it's a mobile experience. It's kind of your first made for mobile experience. Um, so when you were talking about Flower, I read an interview and you said that it was kind of the PlayStation was a portal for players to experience Flower. Um, mm-hmm. So. What was kind of your motivation behind making this a mobile game? Was it so more people could experience it? Uh, yeah, so so what I felt is, um, you know, after you made Journey and by accident you won the game of the year, and then by accident you break two Guinness records for winning two minute awards, <laughs> it becomes becomes very depressing because you know this this kind of luck doesn't happen anymore. You know it probably once in your lifetime and from this point on you're just gonna go downwards right um and so for a very long t- time i was struggling myself just trying to see you know how can i make a game that doesn't disappoint people um and for a very long time i i was hoping oh you know I have to try my best to win another awards but i just knew it's uh it's an impossible uh conflict uh, and instead, I, I started to realize that, you know, my focus should not be about myself. Uh, the, the ego was, would, would always want to, you know, like, you, you got to do better. You're going to, you know, stay on the top. And uh, I've seen so many people fall like that by uh, focusing on ego. And so I, I was thinking, how can I focus on giving back? How could I, you know, do better uh, or more, more than just making a game? Uh, so, so I start to think about what I can help to for the industry uh, because initially when we created this game like Flow, Flower and Journey, we wanted to push the boundary. You know, we just want to make something new. Like we thought that's going to benefit for the industry because it's going to bring new type of players. Um, and when we made Journey, many players told us that uh, this is the first game their wife watched from the beginning to the end and cried. Uh, this is the first game that they let their daughter play and finished. Uh, a lot of players ask me, hey, is it possible to create a mode where I can play with my daughter or my wife together? Because I really want to experience this emotional connection with them. You know, but PlayStation is only one player. Nobody has two HD TV for two PlayStation setup at home. And so at that point, what I was hoping to do is, you know, if I focus on what I can do to help the industry, 
uh, is I should create this example for others to have more opportunity to make, uh, you know, emotional games. Um, and I, I traveled around the world. Uh, many students or developers will come to tell me that how they play Journey and feeling inspired and wanted to make games like this but they couldn't find any publishers or investors to fund their project. Uh, because even though Journey was critically acclaimed, uh, it was not necessarily, uh, you know, like a uh, very influential game in, to, the, to the mass audience. Um, till today, I think maybe there's less than 6 million people who experienced Journey. Uh, and so what I thought is, you know, maybe I could be the trailblazers. I could try to make uh, artistic game to be to be exposed to more people, um, not just hardcore console players, but you know, right now we have, you know, we have 200 million consoles worldwide, but we have two billion smartphones of a lot of people who never play games. And those people's impression on games are pretty much just the uh, match three games or, you know, these uh, simple kind of time waster games. And I thought if I could just, you know, stir the taste buds of the mass. Uh, through a game that is free and it's easily accessible, I, I can potentially prepare or maybe expand the market a little bit so that more people can find opportunities uh, to get funded or get publishers' interest uh, to build this kind of game. Uh, and that's why I thought rather than just keep making another game on console to serve to the same audience, if I could try to break the boundary a little bit and bring in these casual players and to realize games can be emotional and can be positive, uh, then I've done my job to help the industry. Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned there that Sky is a game about uh, altruism and, and kind of generosity. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we've read that two players met in Sky and then ended up getting married. Oh, yes. Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's happening uh, from last year. These these days, there's even more kind of exciting stories uh, in Sky. Well, yeah, what, what are uh, some of the most interesting things that you've you've heard of from players doing, uh, you know, interacting mm -hmm. with one another? So so there is this uh, when, one day I got an email um, uh, from uh, this 67 year old grandma from Hawaii. Uh, she uh, she said I never played any games, but I discovered your app on the App Store, and uh, I run into these young men. Uh, in the game they are very very helpful they took me around the world you know and uh, as she went through the story she cried at the lowest uh, moment and then she cried at the climax kind of similar to journey if you have experienced that um and then she said you know i have never thought that at age 67 there is still love within me and uh, so much for the game that uh, allowed me to uh, experience that again um, I know a, a very kind person must have helped her um, to hold her hands through the world. Uh, but also just the fact, I always thought that I made this game for the lonely people, you know, for the for myself. You know, when, you know, I was lonely, I was hoping to have a emotional connection in a virtual space. And uh, that's why we made the game. But, but that, this email helped me to realize not only are young people lonely, but also the old people. Um, yeah, so to me, you know, she said that our game made her life better, and that's really what it, it really matters to anyone who creates entertainment is when when you when you know you're helping people. Um, yeah, no, it, it sounds incredible, and like you say, it's it's kind of crazy to think that somebody, kind of on that at that point in their life, somebody who's sixty seven mm -hmm. years old might pick up a game for the first time in their life. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, uh, so it, it sounds like the game is kind of it's it's about giving back to other people more than it is about kind of enhancing your own experience. Um, yeah, I, I think we kind of piggyback this concept from Journey. Uh, when we when we made Journey, we just want people to share something very uh, transformative and epic uh, and spiritual together. But what happened is even seven years later, people are still playing this game. And we were just like, you must be like on your 200th round of journey. Why do you keep playing the game? Mm -hmm. And he said just uh, when he first played the game, someone helped him. Uh, and it was so emotional that he felt that he wants to give back and help others. Um, and uh, it was it was that kind of uh, altruistic uh, players that inspired us to uh, design Sky and e including its economy and monetization to be around this very uh, this feeling. Yeah, brilliant. Um, did you kind of deliberately steer away from how toxic kind of multiplayer games can be? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. It, the reason the game took seven years to make is because you know we made a linear game that was supposed to be sold in a in a premium package, and uh, in three years, and then the market shifted. Everybody was stopped paying for games. You know, nobody's paying anything beyond a buck, um, and. At that point,、uh, we were talking to Apple, and they suggested that we should try free to play. And I, I spent a year, you know, looking and studying all the free to play business model, just to discover that, you know, as a designer who is very sensitive to how each mechanics makes you feel, most of these free to play mechanics. Felt very aggressive and malicious,、um, and when I pay in those games, I feel shame. I feel, you know, if, even if I bought something with a discount, I, I have a moment of greed. I'm like, this is cheap, right? And but then, if imagine if you get something cheap and you give it to someone, how does that make you feel?、Uh, you probably won't tell them you got it on a 90% discount, right?、Mm. <laughs> There's certain level of shame about this,、uh, and I was hoping that when we play Sky. When you're giving something to someone, that you should feel proud、uh, instead. And so we had to kind of resist all the most popular free-to-play models and try to do our own, you know, hardcore R and Ds, you know, throwing darts into the、uh, darkness and trying to see if we can find a business model that is positive emotionally.、Um, and so eventually, we find out about, you know, giving.、Uh, When you are give, when you're paying to give to others, it feels not shameful but proud. You know, if you pay a big trip to take your family to Disneyland, you're very proud to announce that because you're spending money for the others.、Um, and we also learn many of the business model,、uh, like Reddit Gold. You know, when you appreciate someone so much that you wanted to give them extra, when you pay that money, you feel good. You know, just like Kickstarters.、Um, So we stayed away with all the negative emotions that we felt from the successful <laughs> free-to-play games, and then we spent a year to prototype,、uh, you know, what we felt is the right way uh, to uh, have our player、uh, feel when they pay,、um, and that's why the game took a very long time to make. Yeah.、Um, so Sky is available on mobile now, and it's coming to Android soon.、Uh, mm-hmm. But you are planning to take it to consoles in the near future. Yes,、uh, Sky is on iOS right now, and with iOS 13, most both PlayStation and、uh, Xbox controller works. You can kind of just play it like a console game now with a giant pad <laughs> or your iPhone, you know.、Um, and we we are in the finishing lap to、uh, get it to Android.、Uh, it should be out,、uh, you know, anytime soon. And、uh, you know, Android. You know, like Nintendo Switch is basically like Android, right? <laughs>、um, and so is、uh, many of the the console devices. So we're pretty close to be able to get、uh, Android out, and afterwards we we have pretty open field, like whether it's PC or console.、Uh, we are still kind of planning、uh, because we are a small studio. We only have thirty people, and you know, only let's three three to four engineers working on the ports. We can't really do all platform at the same time,、uh, so we have to apologize this. But、uh, we will eventually have the game on all the platforms, so that no matter, you know, what device you have at home,、uh, you you can experience Sky with your family. Yeah. So I mean, I know you've you've just said there's no exact time、uh, or date when it's going to come to to other platforms, but. Do you think we're going to see them the, the game come to PS4 and Xbox One, or will they be on the next console? I mean, given what I know from Sony, they and Microsoft, they always are very keen about backwards compatibility. I mean, the game runs on a phone right now; it should run on both consoles. So, yeah.、Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that's that's everything. Yeah, I, I think, think that's、uh, everything we had for you today. Thank you so much for taking the time、mm-hmm. to talk to us. Uh, you're welcome, and thanks for you know letting me to talk about our game and sharing it with your fans. No,、uh, I really appreciate. It. I mean, yeah, I mean, I just want to say just before I let you go,、uh, I, it's something、mm-hmm. I've I, a story I've told a lot、um, on in videos and on podcasts. But when I played Journey when I was 15,、uh, it, <laughs> it, it, it totally、uh-huh. changed my perception of video games and made me want to become a video game journalist. So I have to thank you from、mm-hmm. the bottom of my heart for making that game because、uh, it means a lot to me. So thank you for that, and thank. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's an honor. 
Wow, I I don't know what to say, but uh, you made me very happy today. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Really, yeah. really glad to hear Thank you. That. Thank you so much. Yeah. And um, mm-hmm. I mean, hopefully, talk to you soon if um <laughs> things go well. All right. Thanks. Thanks so mm-hmm. much. Bye for now. Have a good day. You too. Yeah, so that was it. That was the interview with Genova Chen. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you again so much, Genova, for, yeah. for taking the time out of your day to talk to us. From what we could see, he he was stood in a soundproof booth on the edge of an office space. He, yeah. he took almost an hour out of his day to talk to us. When it he, was supposed to be a half an hour interview. Yeah. He, he could not have been more generous with his answers. He could not have been friendlier to us. You know, he was genuinely interested in what we had to say and... Some of our questions, you know, surprised him, as you can probably tell. And he, he was really, really happy to treat us like he would any other journalist. And really, I was shell-shocked at the we end. We were both stunned. <laughs> for, for a good hour after that interview, we sat and basically were just reliving what had happened. Yeah. Um, I mean... I, I didn't know how to sign off on the interview because I was processing yeah. <laughs> just the experience of interviewing someone like him. I mean, this guy is such a huge deal and he's so modest and humble and he would never admit this. You know, he said, I won these awards by accident. I made a game of the year by accident. The thing is, this guy has a huge following. He's a hugely influential figure, I I think, in video games. And he did that entire interview. He sat with us, let us ask whatever questions. He stuck with us through like 10, 15 minutes of technical difficulties that we went through because of Skype. Never use Skype, by the way. Um, but he stuck, he, he stuck with us and, uh, he never once asked us a question about what our audience reach was, which we have, when we've approached other game developers, they have asked, oh, well, what's your audience reach? Because we'll only do an interview with a bigger audience. And he didn't ask that question once. He just was happy to talk to us. And, uh, that speaks volumes about him, the games that he makes, you know, they're very genuine in that case. Yeah. I, I absolutely think that he's leading the charge in a kind of altruistic game developer frame of mind. Yeah. Like, he he wants not so much success for himself as success for everybody around him. Mm. He he wants people to give to each other and he wants it to be almost second nature. Yeah. And hopefully that came through in the interview. Um, obviously, you can get Sky now mm-hmm. on our iOS devices. Just go to the App Store, look up Sky. You have to scroll past some of the remotes, I found out. Mm. Like Sky TV remotes and all that stuff. <laughs> but you um, you get to the game pretty quickly. It's available now. It's coming out on Android. They're very close to releasing it, as yep. he said in the interview. And it's probably coming on consoles at some point in the future. So yeah. do keep your eyes open. Um, but I just want to say thank you again to Genova for coming on the show. Absolutely. It was an honor to have you on. Uh, and I also want to just take a second to thank Jenny Kong from That Game Company for setting up the interview. She was originally going to be the person from That Game Company that we were going to have on the show, but she managed to set us up with, with Genova. So thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we're, we're happy to talk to you anytime. You're an amazing guest. Yeah. And we would love to have Jenny on as well. I, I could never do another interview again, and I would be happy with my experience. Honestly. And that was your first one? It was. It was my first ever Incredible. industry interview, and it yeah. was with Genova Chen. Yeah. Unbelievable scenes. Uh, hope you enjoyed that. Let us know what you thought.